Um, this morning we're continuing on with 50 Days of Transformation, and uh, this morning it's going to scare you because we're going to talk about financial health. Now, don't everybody run for the doors, uh, because we, it, this is not a message that is going to guilt you into giving. It is not. It is not a message on tithing, okay? It's not that. It is a message on being faithful and being a steward of what God has given to you and how you manage that. And there's a big difference, uh, so don't get nervous. John Wesley said that, um, that uh, he would preach faith until he had it because he saw on the ship with the Moravians that he must not have faith because they were as calm as calm can be while he was thinking that he was going to die and not knowing where he was going to end up. And so he just decided that he was going to preach faith until he had it. I have to admit somewhat that I'm just going to preach about this financial stewardship enough to where I have it. Because the Word of God is true and every man is a liar. And that's what the Scripture said. It says. And so I want to tell you, I am not a financial planner, as my wife could, could verify, I am not excellent in regards to these things, but it is a big part of our life. Would you not agree? Most divorces, as a matter of fact, they tell us that most divorces, now I haven't personally experienced this, but most divorces are from uh, financial woes and things that happen within your household uh, that they all center, or a lot of them center around, around uh, money management and how it's managed and where it's given and how it's given. A lot of times uh, there is one that is, uh, like I've been saying, there is one that is a spender and, and a spendthrift, and there is another who is a miser. It's good to have both probably, but it's also a source of tension for both. Uh, it, it is important to know about money. They say if we looked at the Gospels, that um, Jesus talked about money more than he did any other thing within the Bible. Now that's amazing to me. Talked about money more than heaven. Talked about money more than hell. Talked about money more than absolutely everything. Because where our money is, there our, where our treasure is, there is our heart. That's where our heart lies. And so really, if we are going by uh, the scripture in James that says faith without works is death, then we would have to say, let me see your checkbook to find out where your uh, money is going because that is where your heart would be. Amen? So um, we're going to take a look at how money can dominate our lives. Money influences our lives either for the good or for the bad. And let me say this. That there isn't a message in this series that has convicted me, me, more than, than this one right here. Because it talked about management of money. We'll get into that in just a little bit. Jesus said, there once was a rich man who enlisted a manager to take care of his property. But the manager was accused of wasting his master's possession. So the owner called him and said, you must now give an account of your stewardship and report what you've done with what I entrusted to you because your time as a manager is ending. The manager thought, what am I going to do now? Am I losing my job, but I'm not strong enough to dig ditches and I'm too proud to beg? I know what I'll do. So that after I lose my job, I'll have plenty of friends to take care of me. He called in everybody who was in debt to his master. He asked the first man, how much do uh, you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager said, okay, here's what I want you to do. Tear up that bill and write a new bill that says you only owe 400 gallons. This is going to be between me and you. We're not going to tell the boss at all. Next, the manager found another debtor and asked, how much do you owe? The guy said, um, 1,000 1, bushels of wheat. He replied, 
The manager said, okay, change your bill to say only 800. He's doing this under the table, obviously without permission. Now when the master, the owner, heard what the dishonest manager had done, he still praised his shrewdness, for worldly people are more shrewd in handling their affairs than are those who belong to the light. Isn't that an amazing scripture? It seems to me like he's uh, kind of accommodating or he's kind of patting on the back the guy that's shrewd. A few things, though, that I want you to notice about this story. A few things that we should do and a few things that we shouldn't. But first of all, we're going to put it in its context and we're going to say, okay, who is he talking to? You know who he's talking to. He's talking to the individuals that he always had fights with. He's talking to those individuals called the Pharisees. He loved those Pharisees. He's talking about them. And they, who are the Pharisees? The Pharisees, of course, are the religious leaders of Jesus' day. Here are the characteristics of a Pharisee. One, they're incredibly arrogant. Incredibly arrogant. Two, they're self-righteous. They believe that they have set up a righteousness system in which God had no part of, and yet they're incredibly righteous. Next, they're incredibly judgmental. They, uh, they really don't like people at all. I'm telling you this, if you are in the religious field, if you are a pastor, if you are whatever you are, if you don't like people, if you don't love people, it's about time that you get out. Seriously. Uh, somebody said, oh, I know who it was. It was my doctor that came here the first Sunday. She came here and she said, man, Scott, I want to tell you, these people really love you. And I said to her, I really love them too. And you know what? It's pretty cool how that works. But it is. People can tell when you love them or they, you don't love them. Um, the, the next thing is the Pharisee is a hypocrite. They, um, they say one thing but they believe something else. They're hypocrites. They are play actors. They, they do their deal in front of everybody else, but when it comes to doing it in private, they're not going to do it in private. They pray on the street corners, for example, but they don't pray in their regular times. They give and let everybody know how much they're giving, but yet they don't, they don't do that in their, in, when, when it's in private. They do all of those things. And Jesus loved to poke at the Pharisees. Jesus had an amazing ability to comfort the afflicted while afflicting the comfor comfortable. Let me say that again. Jesus had an amazing ability to comfort the afflicted while afflicting the comforter. He still does that today. If you're in pain, any kind of pain whatsoever, whatever kind of pain it is, whether it's physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, whatever it is, I want to tell you Jesus is here to comfort you. But I want to tell you also that if you are self-righteous, if you are a hypocrite, if you are the one that is doing things just for public show, he's going to make life pretty doggone hard on you. He still does that today. Listen to what it says. The Pharisees dearly loved money. When they heard what Jesus said, they made fun of him. But Jesus told them, you're always making yourselves look good, but God sees what's in your heart. The thing that most people think are important are worthless as far as God is concerned. That last phrase, the reason why we're going to look at what we're talking about today. The things that most people think matter, God says they don't matter at all. Remember what our scripture is. Do not be conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the what? By the renewing of your mind, which means what? By the renewing of your thinking. In other words, think differently than you've been taught to think. Think differently than what you've been taught to think outside in the world. Because you can rest assured that the wisdom of man is but foolishness with God. But the wisdom of God is what we are after all the time. Now, what do many people think matters most? First of all, they think possessions matter a whole bunch. 
Pleasure matters tremendously. Sex drives this nation. Status, money, power, those kinds of things. Those are all things that in themselves might not be bad, but the one thing that Jesus said was, don't let it take over your mind. Don't let it conform you to this world. Don't start thinking that these are the most important things in the world. God says those things don't really matter. In this series on transformation, we've been talking about the verse. That verse that says, don't conform to this world's pattern. What God says about money is the opposite of everything most of us have been taught. The second reason that Jesus tells the story is, most believers are poor money managers. This message today is not a message, again, about giving. It's not a message about tithing. This message is about how to think about the money the way God does. Because money is one of the greatest sources of worry. The number one cause, like I said, of divorce is money. It is now not till death do us part, but how debt do us part. We're going to look at today in detail. We learn things not to do with our money, and God says don't do these things with your money and things we need to remember. Let's look at the Bible and see what God has to say. What not to do with our money. First of all, four things not to do. Write these down. First of all, he says don't waste it. Don't waste it. Now this would go against my father-in-law's theory. When my father-in-law, uh, when I married his daughter, he was thrilled to death, by the way. When I married his daughter, um, he told us this. Now, this was way back in, well, let me see. What, what did we get married back in? Uh, just, a, what, nine, 2003, I think it was, wasn't it? And we've been married for 38 years. It was in 1980, so the economy was a little bit different. He sat both of us down and he said, now look it, you guys need to have at least $5 a week that you need to blow. He was going out on a limb there. And I want to tell you, we didn't have $5 a week, and I mean that. Why we would, uh, you've heard me tell the story before, but we had a lazy boy at our house, and, and both he and my dad would come over, and of course that was in the days, you remember, when everybody carried a bunch of change, you remember that? But change was a tremendous thing back then. So we would take this lazy boy, and we'd have Ma, uh, one of the dads sit in the lazy boy, and we would tell him, just lay way back on that thing, way back. Just relax. Just I know your head is below your feet, but that's all right. It's good. It, you'll, you'll really enjoy the lazy boy. Meanwhile, the whole time, the money was filtering out of their pockets, and we would take, and we would say, there was Supreme Donuts right down the street. And we would take that and we would say, man, I'm hungry for a goodie, aren't you? Of course, Kathy always was. And so, and so I would say, let's go down to Supremes and get us a, a, a nutty donut. And they had good nutty donuts. And so we, we would say, but we don't have any money. That's no problem. We'd go over the chair. We'd shake the chair. We would shake out dollars out of that thing in quarters or dimes or nickels or pennies. It didn't matter to us. It was all money to us. And we would go and we would do exactly like my father-in-law said. We would go and we would blow that five bucks as fast as we could get it. Well, we didn't get it. Well, we kind of got it, honestly. <laughs> but the Bible says don't waste money. It says the manager was accused of wasting his master's possession. If I walk around saying it's my money, if I want to waste it, who cares? But you understand, of course, this is God's money. Now, this is what convicted me, you guys. Because I got to thinking, 10% is God's money. Whatever I make, I tithe on. 10% is God's money. 90% of it is God is my money. Now, where I ever got that idea, I'm not quite sure. Because all of it is God's money. 
Now, I got to thinking about that in terms of relationships. What if I came home to my wife and I said, listen, honey, I guarantee you that I will give you 10% of my time, 10%. I guarantee you, I, I guarantee you'll get 10% of my time. What is that in a week? 16.8 hours, isn't it? 168 hours in a week doing the math. 16.8. You have got 16.8 hours of my time. But all the other time, I want to tell you, is save for other people. You know what I mean. Other people and other things. Because I am tithing on my time to you. I thought to myself, our relationship could not stand that. Because nowhere, nowhere, nowhere do we ever, are we ever told that 90% is mine, 10% is God's only. You see, 100% of it is God's. 100%. You say, we ought to tithe the 100 No, I'm not saying that. Don't be ridiculous. The manager was accused of wasting his master's possessions. So he's saying, don't waste it. The second thing is, don't love it. The Bible says we are not to love money. That's what he says in verse 13. No servant can serve two masters. He'll either hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. It is impossible to live with divided allegiance. Third thing, don't trust it. Don't trust money. I don't care how much money you've got, you can lose it. Many of you have found that out. You remember last November when we had the elections, all of a sudden the stock market went skyrocketing for an entire year. Guess what, you guys? The stock market is going back down. You say, well, it's just for the time being. I don't care. Yesterday I trusted it. Today I don't. So what's the story? We cannot trust it. The manager learned this pretty quickly in verse 3. He says, what am I going to do? I am losing my job. Many of you know what it feels like to lose your job. To be put out of work. All of a sudden, you've got no source of income, no security anymore. Never, but I want to say this. Never put your security in anything that can be taken away from you. If you think your security is in the stock market, I want to tell you, it can be taken away. If you think your security is in a bank account, I want to tell you, it can be taken away. Anything can be taken away from it. If you think your security is in, well, I'm healthy as a horse. But it can be taken away from you. The other day, my wife got up and she, her neck hurt really, really bad. She could hardly move it. And so I had a lot of pity on her and compassion. And I tried to do all I could to help her out. But then I got to thinking, you know what? That could be anything in our life. That could be Right now, now I'm always thinking on the positive. So I was thinking, you know what? That could be a heart attack for, by one of us, and one of us could be dead. Now that's bad thinking, isn't it? But it's true. I cannot put my hope in my physical resources. It's impossible to do that. Because I realize, after a back surgery later that I want to tell you that it is impossible to put your hope in that. It will fail you. If you put your security in your appearance, how do you look? I hate to tell you guys this. But you're not always going to be as sexy as what you are right now. I mean, look at me. This is as good as it gets from here on out. The scripture says that beauty fades. 
And it does. It fades and it fades fast. Beauty fades. Today, you might be something that everybody chases. Tomorrow, somebody might, everybody might run away from you. It does happen. Beauty fades. If you put your security in your appearance, I want to tell you that that is going to go away too. Women, 20 years old. They know what men are like. They're hound dogs. That's what they are. They are. It, and I want to tell you, you can have just a teeny little, little, little bit of beauty. And some guy is going to go after you. But I want to tell you, after 30 years, you might have just a little bit of baby fat still on you. And you're not as good as what you used to look. You see, because beauty fades. It's just natural. It's normal. Don't put your faith in something that is going to fade. Something that's not going to last. So don't love it, don't trust it, don't waste it. The fourth thing God says, don't expect it to satisfy. If you think having more will make you happy, make you more secure, make you more important, you are fiercely misguided. Ecclesiastes says again, whoever loves money will never have enough, and whoever loves wealth will never be satisfied with his income. People, I want to tell you, it is simple, it, but it, it, it's true. That the more we have, the more we want. It's true. If you make $100,000, you are going to want $101,000 next year. If you make $102,000, you are going to want $105,000 the next. It doesn't matter how much we have. It's that we have this insatiable urge to always want more and more and more. But don't be conformed to this world's thinking. Be ye transformed by what? By the renewing of your mind. You know how much is enough money to make you satisfied? Enough money to make you happy? You know how much is enough? Is your contentment, your mindset, your belief. That's how much it is. That's the figure you have to have. So, your self-worth has no connection to your net worth. Your values do not determine your value in life. That verse we've been looking at for six weeks, don't conform to the way of the world thinks, but be transformed by the way you think. The renewing of your mind. I want us to look at a story. The story about things God says about money. What to remember every day. First of all, every day I need to remember it all belongs to God. The whole universe belongs to God. The heavens, the sun, the trees, the plants, everything ever created belongs to God. What you think you own is really on loan to you. You don't own it. If you did tell me 80 years from now whose name is going to be on it, it ain't going to be yours. It's not. It's not going to be your name on it. In this story, the, Lord, the owner has all the property and he lets a manager take care of his property. You may not realize it, but you are in management. You are not the owner of what God gives you. You just manage what God has given you. God has put some things in your life under management. You'd have nothing if it weren't for God. Your life, your brain, your thoughts. You say, I worked with my hands to get this. Who do you think gave you your hand? It was God. You weren't in your mother's womb and you just, you just said, hey, you know what, it would be a good idea if, you create, or if I created a hand. And a, and a, no, you didn't do any of that. You look at those babies that come out. They're so helpless, but they're so complete. Now, they can't take credit for any of the way they came out. They can't take credit at all. And neither can 
the two human beings. They say, you know what? Sometimes I hear parents say, you know what? My husband and I make beautiful children. As if they're going to say, we make ugly kids. As a matter of fact, I heard one gal say to me one time, she said, the reason why I stay with my husband is we make beautiful children. I looked at their kids. I said, you do? (laughs) If you go out after the service and you get in your car, you say, this isn't my car, it's God's car. And you go to your home today, and you look at your house, and you say, this is my house. It's not my house. This is God's house. You sit down, you eat your food, you say, guess what? Oh, this is my food. Man, I get possessive of my food. (laughs) It's not my food. It's not my dish. I go home, I lay in my bed, and I think, oh, thank God for this Cristelli bed. It makes my back feel so good. But guess what? It's not my bed at all. It's God's bed. He's loaned it to me while I'm here on earth, and I thank him for it. But it's not mine. And guess what? The upside of this whole line of thinking is your worry goes way down. It goes way down. Let's take the example of the car. I get in my car. My name's on my car. My name is on my car. But it should just say God's car. But they won't do that. The Secretary of State won't do that. And so... um, My name's on the car. But I understand and I go in with the mindset that it's not my car. It's God's car. So I get in a wreck. I turn off the side of the road. I look to the heavens and I say, God, your car just got in a wreck. What are you going to do with your car? You see, your worry goes down. You don't own all those things. You don't, they're only on loan to you. So your worry goes way down. You're, now, does that mean that we should drive a jalopy? Because No, no, it doesn't mean that. So we don't have to worry? No, you drive a jalopy because you do worry about who's going to pay for it or whatever or who's going to come up with the cash. I want to tell you that God owns everything that you have. Everything. Everything. Uh, This hit me hard too. Got to thinking about it. My middle daughter needed braces. So uh, I went. I thought, you know, people have told me before, the braces were very, very expensive. And, uh, and so I, I thought to myself, okay, how, how am I going to pay for this? So I went in, not thinking or not knowing how much braces would be. And uh, the doctor said, the, the doctor that put braces on my child's teeth said this will be a certain amount. And... I kind of laughed. And I said, are you kidding me? He loved that. I said, no. So what I said to Rachel was, Rachel, we're going to trust God for your braces. Really what it was saying was, I have no idea how we're paying for this. But you know what? God did. God did. They tell us now, this was way back 35 years ago, that kids, this is kids now, 35, 40 years ago probably, um, they say, they said that kids from, from birth to um, 18 years of age, this doesn't include prom dresses, which are outrageous, I might add, does not include 
bridal dresses, which are outrageous, I might add, does not include bridal, um, uh, who's, the bridesmaids' dresses, which are outrageous, I might add, does not include all of the goodies like that, does not include a car that you buy your kids, does not include include the insurance that you buy your kids, that it would, now this was 40 years ago, it would cost you from birth until 18, that it would cost you $100,000. That little bundle of joy that God has given to you is going to cost you $100,000 40 years ago. So, Inflation has went up probably now to that little bundle of joy is going to cost you about $250,000. Aren't you glad you had eight kids? I know of nothing that will solve a, a problem of birth control more than that. $250,000. You have got to be kidding me. Where am I going to? Where am I going to come up with $250,000? First of all, you better have a lot of friends. <laughs> Secondly, you better have a lot of friends that are willing to give you hand-me-downs. Third, but not last, you trust in an almighty God. That's who you trust in. You say, God... These are your kids. They're not my kids. You loaned them to me for 18 years. You think you own them? You don't own those kids. You don't own them. Why, five years? I see five-year-olds now that are, uh, our neighbor's five, four-year-old. How old is he? Four. Four years old, last night, I saw him running across the street. His mom, dad was running behind him because all he had on in 30-degree temperature was his underwear and a t-shirt. That's it. You go to his dad, you say, so whose kid is that? Oh, that's mine. Sometimes you don't want to claim him. Here's the point. If I'm in charge, if I'm God, then I've got to pay for it. But if he's God, and he's the one that created your children, and he's the one that's done all of that, then he has to supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Amen? Yeah, you can clap on a sermon that's about money. First verse of the story says, the owner enlisted a manager to take care of his property. How well are you taking care of God's property? Seriously. The rest of this verse says, the guy was wasting his master's possession. Anytime I waste, I'm wasting money, I'm wasting God's money. Second truth, God is using money to test me. God is using money to test me. He's testing me in all kinds of things in life. All kinds of things. Seeing if he can trust me with a little bit. If he can trust me with a little bit, he gives me a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And he's testing me all along the way. Um, it tests three things. Money shows what I love most. How I spend my money reveals to God and everybody else what I love the most. Matthew chapter 4. Don't store up treasures on earth. Instead, tore up, store up treasures in heaven. For whatever your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. You couldn't care less, for example, about how the car company, Ford, if it's making money or not. Unless, unless, you have stock in that company or you have a Ford. And then all of a sudden, you're really interested in that. Why is that? Because you have stock, you have treasure in that company. Microsoft, Apple, whatever it might be. You don't care. It doesn't matter unless you sit down at a, at a computer and you, you, you run that computer and all of a sudden you can't get parts for that computer or whatever and you have to go out and buy a new one. It, you don't care about it. But you do 
when your treasure is in it. says this, don't store up treasure here on earth. Instead, t- store your treasures in heaven. For wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. That's what it says. Secondly, money shows what I really trust most. It shows what I have faith in. Am I trusting my money for security or am I trusting God for my security? Listen to what it says in Proverbs. If you trust in your money, you will fall. But if you trust in God, you will flourish like a green tree. If you're saying, I don't really feel close to God right now, I would challenge you to check your checkbook. Are you okay? I don't feel close to God. It seems like I used to be able to pray. I can't pray anymore. Well, you weren't tested at all either. I I just, everything's cold to me and everything's just rote and everything, I just go through it and that's all. Well, check your checkbook. Where is your treasure? Okay, that went over good. (laughs) It shows if God can trust me. This is the reverse. It doesn't show if I trust God. It shows if God can trust me. Because I'm looking to see how well you manage material things before I give you a spiritual blessing. Listen to what it says. Whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. If you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? You understand, of course, that it doesn't matter. In fact, I I harped on this for a while. People would come, and there was a millionaire that I knew one time, and he would give a million dollars to to an organization or to something for church, and they'd say, wow, can you believe a million dollars? And I would think to myself, yeah, but the dude has 12 million left over. But you see, the principle that God talked about was not the rich man that gave the most money. The principle that God talked about was a little lady, and we call it the widow's might. And he looked on and he saw this lady go in and and and, and hurry up and give her money, and then scoop back out. And he said to his disciples, that was incredible. I haven't seen so much faith demonstrated in all of Jerusalem. Why is that? It wasn't the amount you see. It wasn't that she gave millions. In fact, it was very opposite of that. She gave what she had. And you see, God isn't asking you to give millions. It would be nice. God isn't asking you. The church could use it. God is asking you to give what you have. What you have. And I guarantee you this. If you give what you have, God will trust you with more. Isn't that good? Good but convicting, isn't it? Money is either good nor bad. Money is never good nor bad. It's not either good nor bad. For example, it can be used to build great churches or it can be used to finance drugs. We're all in a meeting. We all sat down and we all got together. All of us preacher guys in Maine. 
It was my first meeting that we were all together, so I knew this would go over well. They said, okay, we're going to go around the group, and we're going to talk about, this was a, uh, what did we call it? What did we call, you know, like those, no, not ways and means. It was kind of like that, though, it, but, but there was, you know, it was at a pastor's retreat, so there was, there was uh, no, it wasn't brainstorming because we don't have any. Um, <laughs> It was kind of the, oh, I know what it was, ethics. Okay, the ethics, hi, is this a good thing ethically? And they came around and they said to all of us, okay, tell me, if there was somebody in your church, now we don't believe in playing the lottery or the blackjack or any of that kind of stuff, we, we feel that our blessings are from God, right? I mean, that's all right. If you do that, stop, don't do it. It's not a good investment. Anyway, or they wouldn't have million-dollar places where you can go play that stuff. They're not stupid, you know. They're not. We are. They're not. So, anyway, we went all around the, the thing. No. I, if, if somebody won the lottery, I, I, w I wouldn't take that money. If somebody was in your congregation, would you take the money if they tithed on that money. I started adding that up. What was the lottery? $1.6 billion? That's a lot of money. So $1.6 billion, what would that equal? $100 million? $106 million? Wouldn't that be 10%? So if they tithed on that money, I would be getting 100 and six million, 160 million dollars. Wow. I thought to myself, I would turn that down? That's stupid. So it got over to me. All the guys, no, I'm not going to do it. No, there's nothing right about it. No, I couldn't do it. I can't, it came to me. I was going to make a big splash in the state of Maine. I was going to tell... I said, I'd take it in a heartbeat. <laughs> they looked at me like, you immoral sinner. You are a heathen, for crying out loud. You're a heathen. I said, money in itself, you guys, is amoral. You know what amoral is? Amoral is not good or bad. Money in itself is not good or bad. It's what we do with the money that's good or bad. Now, I guarantee you that if he went to a person in the drug cart cartel, like El Chapo, let's say. El Chapo, he's in jail now. But if he went, they went to El Chapo and said, listen, I just won $1.6 million, and I'm going to tithe to you. I'm going to give you 10% of that money. Guess what El Chapo says? See, he would say, bring it on, baby. Come on. Why? Because... He would take that money and use it for evil. Not myself. It could fund my yacht. And it could fund my 10 Caribbean houses in the Caribbean. And then I would get to about 150 million. And then I would do something. First of all, I'd pay off this church because it's given me such a hassle of thinking about it. Secondly, you know what I think is cool? I think it's cool that, um, that we go into places that don't have clean drinking for water. Some people have to walk two hours there and two hours back for clean drinking water. I think it's cool when we go in. Wouldn't it be awesome to go in there and to build wells for those people? Wouldn't that be awesome? That'd be so cool. But you see, it's neither good nor bad. It's what we do with that money that's good or bad. The best use of money is to use it to get people into heaven. Jesus says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it's gone, they will welcome you into your eternal dwelling. He's talking about heaven. What is he saying is your use of your money to build relationships that are going to go on for eternity. Eternity. 
spiritual friendships. Imagine one day you're going to die. You get into heaven and there's a hundred people there standing at the entrance of heaven, clapping and cheering, saying, we've been waiting for you. We're so glad you're here. You're, we're here because you spent some money to tell us the good news. Isn't that awesome? Fifth thing, one day I'll give an account to God. One day there's going to be an audit on my entire life. And everything that God gave me, what did you do with what you were given? Your relationships, your opportunities, Jimmy, your talents. These guys, they do a great job, don't they? Don't they do a great job? What did you do with what God gave you? It doesn't really matter if you've got a lot or if you've got a little. Some people have been given ten talents. One person, some people have only got one talent. I hate those people that have ten talents. <laughs> they can sit down at a, at, for example, they can sit down at a piano, never taken a piano lesson in their life. They can sit down at a piano and start banging out a song. How do they do that for crying out loud? They learned it? Or has God given them the ability to be able to do that? Verse 2 says, you must now give an account of your stewardship and report what you've done with what I have entrusted you with because your time as a manager has ended. One day we're going to be called home. And what we've done on this earth is going to matter. There's going to be a reckoning day, God, people. There's going to be a reckoning day. And what we've done with our time, our talents, our money, our truth, all of that, what we've done with that, we're going to have to account for those things. And also our money. Here's the last principle. If I'm faithful... With a little, God can trust me with more. Verse 10 says, Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with little will be dishonest with much. Why don't I have a lot? I'd blow it. Jesus said, to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. 